All right, let's open our Bibles to John 19.31 this morning as we continue our study through John's Gospel. We will finish this chapter this morning, spend four weeks looking at what happened on resurrection morning and evening, and then have Easter service. Can you imagine? So we are close to Easter already. Hope you're praying about who to bring with you and who to share with. So getting close. We finished uh, verse 30 last time with Jesus' declaration, to telestai, a Greek word that means it is finished. And we talked last week about what that meant because it meant more than just his death was finished and his suffering was about over. It meant his earthly ministry was done. That it wouldn't be long before he would be back in fellowship with the Father. That the devil's dominance over man was finished. Jesus would say in John 16 that when the Spirit comes, he is going to convict the world of sin and righteousness and of judgment. And then he said of judgment because the prince of this world has been judged. John would later write, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So Jesus' death brought deliverance from, for man from the, the bondage of the enemy. Not only that, but it brought the Old Testament to a close. The Old Testament was finished. Everything that it, that it represented was accomplished in Christ. And you wouldn't need to go to the temple anymore, and there wouldn't be any more need for animal sacrifice to cover sin. Jesus would now be the, the Passover lamb. Most important, it brought your, the work of your salvation to an end. This is all that's required. Jesus' death is all you need to be saved. That and the repentance, of course, of your sins so that you would depend upon him. So this morning we want to pick up the story and, and finish chapter 19 with John, who gives us two important, I think, issues that are related and kind of attached with verse 35. Uh, from verse 31 through 37, John continues down the path of what he has been doing since the beginning to, to teach us that God has orchestrated everything according to his will. There isn't anything that, that escapes his attention. In fact, even now that Jesus is dead, what is being done with his body is in fulfillment of the scriptures because God's not finished. He's, he still has his way. And then finally, down in the last five verses or so, the response of two men who we may not suspect to see coming to believe in the Lord as a result of the cross and, and make him public and as they step forward to serve him. So we called our, our study this morning Lessons from the Graveyard Shift as we hang around after Jesus has left to see what comes next. Let's begin with verse 31. John said, Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for it was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. And so the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus... They saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. And immediately blood and water came out, and he who has seen, John writes, has testified. His testimony is true. He knows that he's telling the truth so that you might believe that these things were done, that the scripture again should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones should be broken, and again another scripture, they shall look upon him whom they have pierced. So, John continues driving home this truth that Jesus is in complete control and that even, like I said, after his death, his word is still being accomplished. Well, John tells us that it was the motivation of the, the Jews to ask for the bodies to be taken down off the cross was that it was preparation day there in verse 31. You might remember this was the day when the Passover lamb was killed and prepared for the Passover feast. Uh, these are the same religious leaders, by the way, came at dawn this day to pressure Pilate into killing Jesus. They wouldn't go into the Praetorium Hall, his, his place of rulership, because they said, well, we don't want to defile ourselves. We haven't eaten the Passover yet. And now, three o'clock that same afternoon, they come to Pilate and say, could you hurry it along? Could you get these guys dead? Could you get them off the cross? It's a holy day. It's a Sabbath. We, we can't have them hanging on the cross. We have to eat the Passover before six o'clock. And so... You know, these are pretty big hypocrites, aren't they? These are about, this is about religion at its worst. You know, outwardly to act so holy, yet you're trying to kill a, an innocent man, and you're pushing around a spineless man, and now you're asking for consideration for your supposed religious devotion. I mean, it's just sickening, but it's, it's the way religion works. It makes you feel very smug, uh, 
in the keeping of the outward while your heart is so much abandoning God's ways. Well, Pilate gave in. We, we told you a couple of times, spending a month or so in this chapter on the crucifixion, that um, death for crucifixion came in one of two ways. You either bled to death, you bled out, or you asphyxiated. You couldn't breathe any longer. Uh, most crucifixion took place where nails were put in the wrists where the bones joined so that it would support the weight. It wasn't until really later on that the, the fulcrum or the foot kind of place to put your feet were, were put under the feet of, of persons being crucified with, with just one purpose, to allow them to live longer, to die. Um, by the time your diaphragm became weary of, of, of exhaling, and it only takes a few hours, um, the only way that you can survive on a crucifixion is to pull up on your arms, which is extremely painful, or to push up on your feet so that you can exhale. Just you raise up to push out the air. And so Roman crucifixion would let someone hang there. The average time it took someone to die across four days. They wouldn't take them down. They'd let scavenger dogs come and birds of prey and just, it would just kind of just, it was a horrible and awful way, obviously, to die. Um, it was brutal. <laughs> but when you broke the legs of someone being crucified, they would die in minutes, not days. Especially after a couple hours because they wouldn't be able to exhale. Um, so Pilate gave the order just to be rid of these Jews in his life, these religious men that had so leaned upon him. And the soldiers apparently went first to the two men that were crucified with Jesus, and according to history, they would just hit you in the knee with a mallet or a hammer. And it would just cripple you, and you couldn't any longer push up. So uh, I, I suspect even these soldiers hated it, because they came to Jesus, and they saw he was dead and went, good, <laughs> we don't have to do that. But just to be sure, this... One soldier took a spear and he pierced the Lord's side and out of the wound came blood and water, which would suggest that Jesus was not only really dead, but his heart had given out. It was, you know, the water mixed with the blood would suggest constriction of the pericardium, which means, you know, through shock and heart failure, it just quit working. So the Lord was not there and John was. In fact, he mentions in verse 35 in, in trying to encourage his readers, look, I'm not lying to you. I was there. I saw this with my own eyes. This is what I want you to know and I want you to learn. I want you to be aware of. And, and um, even Pilate, according to Mark 15, when um, he was asked for the body of Jesus, he was surprised that he was dead so soon. In fact, he sent a centurion to check. Did you break his legs? No, he didn't need to. He was dead. Well, go check before he gave the body to Joseph. So um, John is interested, like I said, in you believing in Jesus both as God and as your Savior and Lord because he's God. And, and understand that John wrote this 60 years after the event. Um, and yet it was like, of, of course, as crystal clear as the day he was there. This is something I don't think you can forget so easily. But John by now has connected all the dots. He didn't get it this day that he was there. It was just horrible. But now he's had, you know, a generation and a half to read the scriptures and seeing all that God did. And as he was writing, he noticed in verse 36 and 37, goes back to that same pattern that he's always followed. Hey, this, was, this all happened because God said it would. This all happened because he's in charge of, of all that goes on. And John pulls out the scriptures to substantiate even what happened to Jesus' body after his death. So he quotes there in verse 36 out of Psalm 34, verse 20, which said, he will guard all of his bones and not one of them will be broken. Now that's pretty amazing because that's usually the way you hurry death along. And, and remember the religious leaders wanted to hurry death along. Had Jesus not died at three, by four he would have had his legs broken and every picture that you had of the Passover lamb would be ruined. Right? You go to Exodus chapter 12 and it talks about the lamb that, that was to be slain or, and the blood placed on the door uh, and over the door of, of, the, of the homes in which those who believed live. And you read there in verse 46, don't break one of its bones. You, you read in Numbers when the, when the second Passover takes place and they're reminded again of how to, how to keep this Passover in the wilderness. And they said, don't leave it till morning. Don't break one of its bones. And, and, and it's that constant picture of the, the lamb would not have a broken bone. And then the Lord comes, our Passover lamb. So it was absolutely important that his 
bones were not broken. If they were, you would have to set the Bible aside as untrustworthy and undependable. You would have, it would negate everything that you'd learned up to that point about who Jesus was. But John, 60 years later in the 90s, writing it all down, yeah, that's just the way the Lord said it would be. And he quotes right out of the psalm. And then he adds um, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10 and verse 37, which is really a prophecy of the return of the Lord for the second time, his second coming. And it speaks of Israel's response to him. And, the, and John, uh, Zechariah writes, though mourn for him as somebody who would mourn for his only son, grieve for him as one who grieved for his firstborn, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. Same word. Of all the things that he might have pointed to, that when Jesus returns, they will see him whom they've pierced. Which leads us to Revelation chapter 5, because this same apostle John also wrote the book of Revelation. And in one of the visions that the Lord gave him as he was writing it down, he was taken to heaven after the church age. And in chapter 5, he saw the heavenly scene, and the, he who sat on the throne with the title deed to the earth in his hand extended, and an angel declaring, is there anyone that's able to uh, take the scrolls and loose the seals thereof? And John said there was weeping because it didn't seem like there was anyone that could do it until John said he looked and he saw one like a lamb who had been slain step forward and take the scroll. And Jesus then comes into John's vision. But interestingly enough, just like Zachariah says, the only man-made things we're going to see in heaven are the scars of the Lord. He's going to bear them in his new body and the one we're going to see. So the piercing on the side, the hands and feet that were uh, pierced. And John pulls that scripture out of uh, a Zechariah prophecy and said, this needed to happen. This needed to take place. But, but notice that John in verse 35, all he said is, I'm just telling you this like I've seen it, like I know it, so that you may believe. Right? That's John's entire interest, which is why so often we tell people, hey, read the book of John. <laughs> read the gospel of John. Uh, 879 verses, and in them 100 forms of the word believe. So literally more than one every nine verses comes that same word, believe, 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 believe in him. And that's John's concern. So John, years later, is still moved to think he was there and seeing the plans of God unfold in charge of every moving part. You just got to believe in him. <laughs> and John, whatever it would take to convince you, he did. Well, John's last view of, of that day is from the graveyard. And he focuses on two very powerful members of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court, responsible for making literally every decision about the politics and the religious life of those in Israel. They were instrumental, the, the Sanhedrin was, in pushing for Jesus' crucifixion. He didn't fit the mold. Um, he was a threat to their existence. He exposed them for who they were. They hated him early on. They hated him a lot until they could get rid of him. These two men are, are different in the sense that, you know, the Bible would have us to understand that, for the most part, the church consists of common people. You will read, for example, I think it's in, in uh, I'm pretty sure it's in Mark 12, where it says, the common people heard him gladly. Paul would write years later to the Corinthians, Look, brethren, you know that there's not many wise according to the flesh, or many mighty, or many noble that God calls, but God has chosen the foolish things to confound the wise. And most of us can go, yeah, amen to that. But here are two guys that were not common people. They were far from, you know, the run-of-the-mill fellows living in Jerusalem, if you will, at the time. These guys were like Paul. They were um, highly educated. They were erudite. They could speak clearly. They were passionate. They were committed to their cause. They were powerful and influential and wealthy. And yet these two guys, as a result of the cross, come out of the shadows and make themselves and their commitment to Jesus public. I'm always encouraged by Joseph and Nicodemus because sometimes you share with people that seem to be way too intelligent. And you think, oh, they're so smart and everything. They'll never listen. And then you think about these guys. Well, they listened. And so don't ever write anybody off as you pray for them and share with them because... You don't ever know what's going on in their hearts. Years ago, we went to a conference that Billy Graham was speaking at, and he was teaching us about how do you view your audience. That was his, his message was, you know, when he went to do the Crusades, what did he think about when he looked at these tens of thousands of faces? 
And he said to us, you know, the things that always I keep in mind are that every life is empty without Jesus. And that folks are lonely even when they're surrounded by many friends. And that most people carry a burden of guilt around for sin. And there is a universal fear of death. And so I know that as I share the gospel, that God will work. And that I expect God to work. And I expect people to hear and believe. Spurgeon years ago in, in speaking to a fellow pastor who was discouraged that his congregation wasn't seeing many salvations said to this young pastor do you really expect God to save someone at every service and the young pastor said of course not and Spurgeon said that's your problem because God wants to work we expect far less from God than God would want to do and so I, I think that John having gotten to it is finished, and then realizing, looking back, had how even after his death, that everything that took place, God had led us to know that would happen, did happen. And then John can't help but finish at least the day of the crucifixion by saying, and here's a couple of guys who saw that too. And they weren't just your ordinary, run-of-the-mill, common people who heard him gladly. These guys would have taken some convincing, maybe. They had some you know, some hurdles to overcome that most folks don't, not the least of which was their position and their wealth and their intelligence and, and, and their influence and their societal standing. But none of that mattered once the cross got to their heart. And I think that's why John put, the, you know, the picture of these two guys growing in the Lord out of the shadows. Joseph of Arimathea, verse 38, we are told in the Bible, was a council member. He was one of the original Sanhedrin or of his time, the ruling Supreme Court of the Jews, he is called by Mark an honorable counselor, a, a distinguished member. He was held in high esteem. People sought out his counsel. He was an older guy with lots of wisdom. His word carried a lot of weight. Matthew tells us he was a rich man from a town 20 miles or so northwest of Jerusalem, a place called Rama, which is where, if you might remember, Samuel was born. Luke adds he was a good man. He was a just man. The word good speaks of character. It's an inward quality. The, the word just speaks of outward, of a, a behavior. Joseph was a different guy. He was waiting for the kingdom, is what we're told in the scriptures. But we are also told a couple of things about the Sanhedrin. Number one, that the council unanimously voted to put Jesus to death. And in Mark 15, that they all went together, every one of them to Pilate, and then, first of all, to the meeting to get it, you know, their charges together. And then over to Pilate to get Jesus uh, killed. But we are told that Luke 23, I think verse 51, that, that Joseph was one of the fellows not consenting to his death. But he was waiting for the kingdom of God. He was looking for the Lord to come. So, I, I, you know, two and two, you have to believe that both Joseph and Nicodemus skipped a few meetings. <laughs> They'd had enough of this. They weren't a part of that. And, and they didn't want to be a part. Joseph was a believer for some time in God's word and in the prophecies of the coming Messiah. And at some place along the way, he had determined that Jesus was indeed the one that they were looking for. They, he was a believer in Jesus. But he hadn't put his faith on display because according to John 19, verse 38 here, he was a secret disciple. I don't know how long he believed. But I do know he was not the only one on the Sanhedrin that did believe. John tells us in chapter 12, verse 42, that among the rulers, many believed in Jesus. But because of the Pharisees, they didn't con confess him. They didn't want to be put out of the synagogue. And then it says they loved the praises of men more than the praises of God. So this was an interesting fella. Now we've looked before, and I think a couple of Easter's ago, we talked about these two men and how um, fear can absolutely negate your discipleship or, or your life in terms of serving the Lord. And it certainly had for both Joe and Nick, we'll just call them by their first names, had they come out of the closet a little earlier, by the way, everyone's coming out of the closet, don't you think the Christian should? I'd like to redeem the get out of the closet again for ourselves. Um, they could have had the privilege of walking with Jesus for three and a half years. They could have sat at his feet and asked questions and watched his work. They lost a lot by, by hiding out, by being ashamed or being afraid. 
And we've talked about the, the downside of that, but, but I think that John places it here in, our, in context, not for that purpose, but for the positive side. Because the cross did something to these men. They may have believed for quite some time, but the cross put them over the top, and, and it drove them out of the shadows and into the light. They finally came. You know, I know there are plenty of Christians and young Christians as well as old who are paralyzed by fear of what other people think about them in terms of their faith. And the world isn't making it easier for you to walk with the Lord, but, but there's this willingness to court the approval of the world and in the process lose your effectiveness as a Christian because, you know, you don't want people to know. You can believe in Jesus this morning and be fruitless in your walk. And get through life that way. People will love you and you'll make it to heaven because God is gracious, but you won't leave much fruit behind. And that's really what you want to bring with you, isn't it? You want to bring fruit with you. So, um, fruitless, fruitlessness because of fear, but fruitfulness because of boldness and faith. But that faith is usually emboldened by something. And for Joseph and for Nicodemus, it was driven by the realization of God's great love for them and his sacrifice. It was enough to, to drive them forward. And for them to step out. And I think if, if the church would come out and step up for Jesus, the, the playing field in the world would be leveled. Every special interest group demands attention. And they get it. And the church just quietly sits by. We would be better off just demanding our little piece of the pie. Hey, we're going to stand up for Jesus. We, we want to pray in the school. We want to pray. In fact, we're going to pray. Silently, all right, fine, but we're praying. Just so you know, I'm praying right now, right here. <laughs> Nicodemus in verse 39 also finds himself outed at the cross he also had been a seeker in fact if you remember he was an early on guy John 3 that's early on first year in Jesus' public ministry or right near the second, beginning of the second year and, and he had come with lots of questions he had, uh, he had also associated Jesus with, with what he was waiting for and, and he's another fellow that is driven out of the shadows by the cross John, you know, doesn't let Nicodemus slide. He mentions his name. Every time he does, he said he came to Jesus at night. Every time. Won't let him off the ground. Nick at night, Nick at night, Nick at night. That's all you read. Now, John had, had recorded back in chapter 7 that at one of those council meetings, Nicodemus had tried to speak up for Jesus. They, they were determined to get him and to kill him and to get rid of him. And Nicodemus said, well, how can we judge someone even before we hear from him? And they said, oh, I suppose you're a Galilean too. You're on his side. And that was it for him. Ah, never mind. He didn't say anything after that. What do you suppose brought both these guys out? What do you think did it to bring two men who probably didn't know of each other until they showed up and wondered what each other was doing there? What do you suppose drove them out? Do you think it was guilt? Could have been. Or maybe anger. How dare they treat our Lord? We cannot tolerate this. Maybe it was some sense of loyalty. I've got to step up now. And I would say to you, the answer is, who cares? Who cares what God uses to get you to him? He wants you to come. And whatever it takes, great. They came forward now. It was difficult. It was costly. For the rest of their lives, they would walk with the Lord. They would no longer be welcome in the synagogue. They would no longer be a part of the Sanhedrin. Their social status was ruined. Their power base was ruined. Their finances would be ruined. Their reputation would be gone. But now it was all right to set all of that aside. They would even be defiled for the Passover meal. That didn't seem to matter either. We've got to do the right thing. And you find them at the end of their, uh, of the, uh, at least the discussion in the, in the Gospels, free to serve the Lord. And they would start right now. You know, one thing that you discover from the Bible is the Lord never makes provision for secret disciples. He always sent us out publicly. He said, said to us in no uncertain terms, if you'll confess me before men, then I will confess you before my Father. But if you won't, then neither will I confess you. That's, that's powerful language, but, but how can we hide what God has done if we truly believe what he's done? How can we turn away? You know, you have to live for him openly. Joseph went boldly to Pilate because the cross had changed him. His sacrifice for him had moved him. He could sit still no longer. 
And so he went to Pilate, and, and Mark writes the words boldly. And like I said, Pilate was surprised that Jesus was already dead, sent to find out about it. But understand that for Joseph, this took a lot of courage, both because of who he was in the culture, society, and also what was going on. There was this mob mentality. Blood was in the water, right? There was this move against the believers. Discipleship's dangerous. <laughs> if you want to be loved by everyone, it's going to be hard for you to walk with Jesus. And most people want that. You know, you don't want enemies. You don't want people standing against you. But look, the world's not going to like the fact you're walking with the Lord. It's just the way it is. And sometimes even your peers won't like it. They'll sit in the pew with you. I think it was William Barclay who wrote, Christianity is something that is meant to be seen. There's no such thing as secret discipleship because the secrecy, either it will destroy the discipleship or the discipleship will destroy the secrecy. You, you really can't love the praises of men for long while trying to seek the praises of God. But the good news is these two guys made it. It was gradual, it was hesitant, it was faltering. But, but the bottom line is they, they both made a decision, a decisive act at a critical time and when they came to the Lord, they were both willing to follow him completely and openly at tremendous personal cost. Not, not the least of which we mentioned already was, you know, the loss of their place and position and power and, and, and wealth and all. That was gone, but they were willing to come. And they both brought sacrifices. Joseph would give Jesus his tomb. Nicodemus, we read, brought a hundred pounds of aloe and myrrh. Both of them sacrificed much personally and gave much personally. In fact, at the end of verse 39, this is the first time you see Nicodemus in the daylight. And he's doing something crazy. He's bringing 100 pounds of aloe. Now, I went and looked around in ancient records to see how many pounds of, of spices they buried kings with, and it wasn't 100 pounds. So, so old Nicodemus was making up for lost time. <laughs> I'm just going to give him 100 pounds. It would have cost him a small fortune to bring this much myrrh with him. Um, and I don't think Joseph would realize that Jesus wasn't going to take his, his tomb. He was just going to borrow it for the weekend. I don't know if that, he knew that either. We, we mentioned to you a couple weeks ago that myrrh is that sticky, gummy residence that, or a residence, resin, um, that if you, if you make it into powder and then mix it with a liquid, it smells a lot like sandalwood, but it, it hardens very quickly. So the, the typical Jewish burial was to wrap a body in, in strips of cloth and then to place in the folds between the cloth this liquid um, myrrh. And, and if you wrapped a complete body and up to the neck, the head wouldn't ever be wrapped, it literally in, in a matter of hours would form a, a, almost like a mummy or a cocoon, which is probably what John and Peter saw when they went into the grave that day. It wouldn't just be a bunch of strips of clothing laying on the ground, but the form of a body with no body. So that Jesus just stepped out of it, took the cloths off of his head, folded them up, put them away, and had other things to do, right? But John, seeing that form, was convinced of his resurrection. Peter just was more confused. But that's what is probably happening, and, and it is the result of Nicodemus bringing an excess amount of spices for his burial. But both bring costly gifts, personal gifts, and they make themselves known they are out there doing it wholeheartedly. So we read in verse 40 and 41 and 42 that they took his body down, they transported it to the bottom of the hill, they prepared it for burial, they placed it in the tomb. The gospel tells us that Mary watched the whole thing take place, Magdalene. Um, they came with their life, though, their time, their resources, their energy, and the cure for their secret discipleship seemed to be that they realized the love of Jesus for them, and it motivated them to go forward. I'll tell you what will cure your fear uh, of, of, of criticism and, and your love for the praises of men. Just sit down and realize what God did to save you. And then you kind of owe him, don't you? you? You love him because he first loved you. You can hear people speak evil of him and speak down about him or... or or minimize who he is, but you can't sit still. All right, that's what you think here. Let me tell you what I think. <laughs> and let me tell you why I believe what I do. And that was John's heart, and it can be yours. And, and the world's out there, man. They're, they're lost. There's a fields that, that are white under harvest. All you have to have is the heart of Jesus for the lost. Make it a, make it a, a career. <laughs> make it a life goal. 
Lead someone to Jesus this week. Talk to someone about the Lord today. God, use me. God, open doors. Be bold. He did all that he could to save you. What else could he have done? He just asked that you are proud of him and speak of him. That's all. Good enough? Father, we thank you this morning for your goodness to us. And as we sit around the graveyard watching the actions that John wants us to see, we realize that your death for our sin changed the heart of these two men immediately. And what was once done in secret and, and, and faith that was born in the shadows no longer resides there. It comes out in the open. It, it declares itself. It puts itself at risk. It loses much in this world for the sake of the glory of God. And we see it with Joseph, and we see it with Nicodemus. And Lord, I pray we would see it with us, that we wouldn't be so uh, unsure of our faith or so unmoved by your love that we could live in the closet, but that we would come out for you, all of us, and stand up so that the world might take notice. We believe in Jesus. He's our Lord. He gave his life so that we might live. We're not ashamed of him or of the gospel. We don't care to be approved by the world, but we want to reach the world. And the Lord has called us to go to every creature and preach his name. So Father, may we do that each day. May we be committed to and, and consumed with and concerned about the, the heart of the lost. And may you move in our midst. If you don't know Jesus this morning, though, there's folks here, that, the pastors will be up front. Come and talk to one of them. Let them show you in the Bible how and why you must be born again and what God promises to do if you call upon his name. Don't put it off another day. Come today. You need him. And there is only one name given in, in God's economy whereby you can be saved, and his name is Jesus. And for those of you that know the Lord but have been hiding out, I'm just calling you out this morning. Come on. Step up. He's worthy to be praised. His name is worthy to be exalted. And God will use you, if you're willing, to be used. Shall we stand?